All right. Well, our uh, review session on WebEx did not get recorded. It keeps telling me that they're processing the recording, but I don't have it. Um, so this is going to be a quick review for exam two. Uh, going to just kind of highlight some of the points in each of the chapters that are on that exam. Um, and then we will touch on a couple points maybe quickly from the discussion, um, but it's going to be a fairly quick overview, hopefully just to help you focus in a little bit and make sure you get some of the key points. Uh, so chapter five, I think we went over pretty thoroughly. Um, everybody should be good on viruses. This table gives us the properties of viruses. They are generally considered non-living because they don't have metabolism or homeostasis. They can't reproduce or survive outside of a host. They must be inside a host cell. Um, they are everywhere. They are ultra microscopic in size. Uh, so they are smaller than eukaryotes, clearly. Very small, smaller than uh, most bacteria. There are some large viruses, but typically smaller. Uh, than most bacteria. They um, have a basic structure. They have a specific structure of their capsid. That's one of the ways that we classify them is knowing their specific shape of their capsid, of the protein coat. Um, and then we also classify them by what type of nucleic acid they carry. Um, they can carry DNA or RNA, but they don't carry both, one or the other. And they have surface molecules, those protein spikes that are very specific and used for attachment to a host. Uh, and they can only multiply by hijacking a host cell's um, metabolic uh, and synthesis mechanisms. So they use their host for their enzymes, for their chemical reactions that it takes to replicate them, and for synthesizing the proteins that they'll need to do that. So they're totally dependent on being inside a host cell. The components um, of viruses, all viruses have a capsid. That's the protein shell around their nucleic acid. And the capsid is made out of individual proteins called capsomeres. They come together into a specific shape. They can be a helical protein coat. So a helix with the nucleic acid um, down the middle of that spiral, or they can be icosahedral, which is um, a series of triangles. So the capsomeres come together to form a triangle. The tri triangles come together to form um, an angular kind of ball, and the nucleic acid is inside that. And that together, the capsid with the nucleic acid is called the nucleocapsid. Some, not all viruses, have envelopes. These usually come from stealing part of the host's membrane as they leave the cell through budding. Um, they have spikes. These are found on either naked or enveloped viruses. Uh, and they are the specific attachment mechanism for how the virus attaches to a host cell. And we use the term virion to describe one single fully formed viral particle. Our nucleic acids we look at, we can have DNA viruses or RNA viruses. For DNA, we can either have single-stranded DNA or double-stranded DNA. And same for RNA viruses. We can have double-stranded, two strands of RNA, a positive and a negative sense strand, but more often they're single-stranded RNA viruses. When we say a positive sense RNA, um, for viruses, we're talking about what we would equate with the messenger RNA in other ce in cells, in true cells. That means this is the one that's going to be translated at the ribosome. The negative sense RNA has the complementary base pairs to that. So it would first have to be replicated using that negative strand as the template matching its complementary base pairs to give us the positive sense strand. So it has to be converted before it can be translated and complementary base pairing does that. This would in our puzzle that we did be similar to the tRNA. The difference is we are never going to 
um, copy the tRNA for anything. The tRNA only has its job is to carry amino acids from the cytoplasm to the ribosome. The negative strand RNA in viruses isn't going to do that. It doesn't behave like a tRNA. It doesn't have that job. It's just the complementary strand to the positive RNA that will be translated to a protein. Um, some viruses carry their own enzymes. Typically, viruses are set up to be super efficient. Uh, if they don't need it, if they can get it from their host, they're not going to make it or carry it for themselves. Um, and so any enzyme the host has that the virus can use at will. When a virus brings its own enzyme, it's to help with synthesis uh, of a component that the host cell doesn't normally do. So cells, we start with DNA. We use that to transcribe our, our RNA, and we use the RNA um, to translate into a protein. Some of the things that our cells will never do is take one strand of RNA and make a second RNA copy from it with complementary base pairing. So we never transcribe RNA from RNA. We always get our RNA from DNA. So if an RNA virus comes in and needs to make the complementary RNA strand, we don't have enzymes for that. Cells don't do that, so cells don't have that enzyme. So viruses have to bring in their own enzyme to replicate RNA. It's called RNA replicase or RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Remember, RNA polymerase is the enzyme that build, builds the polymer RNA. So our RNA polymerase is DNA dependent. It's built from DNA directions. It, it uses DNA as its template to build the RNA. So to build RNA from RNA, uh, we don't have that. The virus has to make and carry its own enzyme. The other thing that we never do, that viruses do, that no cells do, is make DNA from RNA. So viruses that do that, like HIV, have to bring in their own enzyme, reverse transcriptase. Uh, table 5.4 in the text uh, has the life cycle of animal viruses. Those are those steps that we did in our discussion. Adsorption, penetration and uncoding, synthesis, assembly and maturation, those Two words are sometimes used to describe the same that step together. And then release. So remember, our first question in that discussion was about uh, the difference between enveloped and naked viruses. And those differences came in the first step, adsorption, and in this last step, release. So those will be different depending on if a virus is enveloped or naked. And then that third step, synthesis, what we're going to build depends entirely on what we come in with, specifically what nucleic acid the virus comes into the cell with. Um, so I posted this table, 5.5, uh, that is not in your text. It's not in this version of the text, so it's posted in D2L, that has a summary of viral transcription and translation. So we will always have to um, transcribe into RNA and then translate into uh, protein, because we need proteins for the protein coat. Uh, if we come in with DNA, we might have to do some DNA replication because we have to build lots more DNA to send out in our new virions. Um, and if we come in with RNA, we are going to use that RNA either to build proteins for the protein coat um, or to build the complementary strand that can build the proteins. But we're also going to make the complementary strand to that, even if we come in as a single strand, because that complementary strand will then be the template to build more of the type of RNA we came in with so that we have enough to fill all the virions that are going to leave. Um, we talked about bacteriophages. These are our complex viruses. They don't just have icosahedral or helical coats, they have both of those combined um, with a head that's icosahedral and contains the nucleic acid. And then they have a sheath off of that that's helical proteins. And their spikes are specialized for attachment to the surface of the bacterial cell. And then they'll inject 
a protein tube into the cell. So they basically work like a syringe to get the nucleic acid into the cell. They never, the protein coat never enters the cell. So for their steps, they don't actually have to penetrate and uncoat. They just shoot that nucleic acid directly through the cell wall and membrane, and then the protein coat falls off. They do synthesize new proteins for a protein coat, so they make complete virions inside the bacteria. But it was through bacteriophages that scientists uh, worked out the two different life, life cycles of bacteria, the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. So the lytic cycle, this is the one we're gonna just all out kill the cells once we infect them because we're gonna go in, take over all of their machinery, and just make lots and lots and lots of copies during that synthesis phase of our nucleic acid, our protein coat. Uh, during maturation and assembly, the protein coat and nucleic acid come together and then release, we're gonna burst out of that cell. Even if we leave, even if this virus leaves through budding, it will eventually have stolen away so much of that plasma membrane um, that the cell will eventually you know, uh, just fall apart basically, we're leaving holes in the plasma membrane. Uh, so the end result of the lytic cycle is cell death. The lysogenic cycle starts similarly with the virus entering, penetrating and uncoating, but then the DNA will integrate into the viral, D into uh, the host DNA. So the virus DNA is going to integrate into there. In the case of HIV that comes in with an RNA strand. First, it'll use that reverse transcriptase to make the complementary DNA strand. It'll use the host's DNA polymerase to make the complementary strand to come up with a double strand of DNA. And then that will integrate into the host cell DNA. Now, every time that cell undergoes mitosis uh, or binary fission for bacteria and replicates uh, that viral nucleic acid gets copied and carried on into the daughter cells. And periodically, we'll have excision of that provirus of the uh, viral DNA will come out to get copied and it will start going through transcription, translation, uh, replication for DNA, making all of its parts in the synthesis step and then maturation and assembly, and it will enter into the lytic cycle and then infect neighboring cells. Uh, so it will ultimately kill cells when it comes out of that lysogenic or latent part of its life cycle, um, but it can stay in that, in that latent portion of the cycle, sometimes forever, sometimes will never uh, show symptoms, it will never express. All right, so virus, um, that's chapter 11, or chapter five. Next, we covered chapter 11. Uh, and in chapter 11, we were talking about human microbe interactions. And some of the first section, um, section 11.1, is about our normal microbiota and where that comes from. So we have bacteria that live in us and on us that are supposed to be there, that are helpful. Uh, and we're still learning and quantifying and qualifying all of those, but they're basically everywhere. And where they come from, uh, initial colonization is of newborns, uh, either through the birth canal um, or through handling. Uh, they get some in utero during fetal development. And then as they're handled by their parents, uh, by doctors, by siblings, by their family, uh, through the food they eat, through breast milk, they acquire more of that normal biota. So that's where we get our initial um, inoculation, baby, basically of our normal microbial um, flora. In 11.2, we actually start talking about disease. Uh, and some of the terms we've already used and discussed, we give specific definitions. Pathogenicity is the ability of a bacteria uh, to cause disease or of a an organism to cause disease, a pathogen to cause disease. Uh, virulence uh, has to do with the intensity of that disease. So if an organism can cause disease, uh, then we can have different ranges of virulence, how violent or how 
extreme the symptoms are. And the virulence factors are the ways that the bacteria can do that. And so we have pathogens that are true pathogens. They always cause illness. And we also have opportunistic pathogens that are just normal, non, typically don't cause illness or infection in normal healthy hosts, but when given the opportunity, um, either because they get somewhere they shouldn't be, um, or because the host has a weakened immune system, is immunocompromised, uh, they can cause disease. Uh, we'll go through the different steps of pathogens pathogen takes, what has to happen. There's a specific series of steps that need to take place before a pathogen can cause disease. And those steps begin and end with portals of entry and exit. So we'll look at those. Uh, and then the last thing this section talks about is infectious dose and explain its role in establishing infection. I think that term is pretty straightforward, so we won't spend a lot of time on it. But the infectious dose is what number What's the load of this pathogen that I need before it starts to cause signs and symptoms, before an infection can take hold and spread? Uh, some organisms have a very low infectious dose, meaning it doesn't take that many of them to cause illness. So those would be more virulent. Um, Others, it takes a lot. It's based on load. You have to have a lot of microbes or a lot of organisms, pathogens present uh, before you see any signs and symptoms. So a higher infectious dose has lower virulence or less pathogenicity. Um, we'll look at the ways that microbes cause tissue damage. Because um, if they don't cause damage once they've infected us, do we really care? Uh, then they're either just symbionts, they might just be commensals, they're not doing any damage, so who cares? Uh, some of the ways they do that are with enzymes and with toxins. Uh, and then we have a graph showing the stages of disease in a human. And I just want to make sure we get a good look at that and know the difference between that and the graph that you labeled and discuss in Chapter 6 on bacterial growth. Uh, as we go through talking about disease, there are a number of terms, a lot of vocabulary uh, that has to do with where these pathogens come from and how they're transmitted. So you want to spend some time on vocabulary here. Um, reservoirs, where would you normally find this bacteria? How would, how would a host come into contact with it? Uh, is it direct transmission or indirect? Direct means there has to be physical proximity between an infected person and who they transmit it to versus indirect be something like I blow my nose on a tissue and I leave it on the table and somebody else comes up and picks it up and throws it out and they have touched that and now they get it. That's indirect transmission. Um, and that tissue would be a fomite. A vector would be when it's transmitted, say, from person to person like malaria through a mosquito. So usually a vector is a arthropod, an insect. And vehicle transmission is how can it move through the environment from place to place? So I like to think of for vehicles. So it can move through the air. It can move through the water. So I think of a vehicle as something that moves or flows. Air, water, soil can be blown in the wind and you inhale it. Um, but so how does it move? How does it move? Uh, so that's through a vehicle. So a vehicle would be non-living Non-living thing that flows, that's how to differentiate vehicle from a fomite. A fomite's an object that can be touched, hold on to this pathogen, the next person that touches it gets it. Vehicle is, it moves this pathogen from place to place. Uh, different modes of transmission, that would be vehicle, vector, fomites. You can have biological transmission when a mosquito um, bites. It actually breaks the skin, so parenteral root. You have um, mechanical, maybe a fly just brings something on its feet and passes that pathogen. Um, talk about healthcare associated infections, which are nosocomial infections, is the word for that. And Koch's postulates and their significance, we talked about that in our, um, in our, 
discussion group, sorry. All right, so pathogenicity is an organism's potential to cause infection or disease. True pathogens are capable of causing disease even in healthy persons. Opportunistic pathogens uh, only cause disease either when the host is compromised or if they become established in a part of uh, the body that's not natural to them. Virulence is the relative severity of a disease caused by a microbe. It's the degree of pathogenicity, uh, and it's determined by the microbe's ability to establish itself in the host. So can it get in and stay in? Um, can it evade the host's defenses? And can it cause damage? And our virulence factors are any characteristic or structure of the microbe uh, or pathogen possesses that contributes to its ability to do those things, to establish itself and cause damage. So the steps, what a pathogen actually has to do um, for, us, for it to be of concern, for it to be a pathogen, it has to get in. Uh, pathogens have specific portals of entry. For example, the coronavirus is respiratory. It has to enter into the respiratory system. If I touch it on my hands, I'm not going to get it. Um, and if I wash my hands, then that's it, end of virus. If my hand comes close to my nose or face, face and I inhale it into my respiratory system, well, then that's the correct portal of entry. Um, so bacteria or pathogens all have specific, very specific portals of entry. If they go, uh, if you are exposed to them through the wrong portal of entry, uh, the rest of this process doesn't happen. So they have to get in through the correct portal of entry. They have to be able to stay in. That has to do with adhesion. They have to be able to adhere to the host cells or tissues. They have to evade host defenses. So they have to have some way to hide from the host. So we talked about uh, that glycocalyx, the capsule, as being an invisibility cloak. Then even if they do all that but don't cause damage to the host, we wouldn't even know they were there. So they do have to cause some sort of damage um, that's going to elicit an immune response. And then the final step, if they just got into a host and stopped, then that would be the end of them. They would affect the life of a single host. Um, but they need to spread to new hosts. So transmission, how do I get from one host to another? And there are specific portals of exit, just as there are specific portals of, tran of transmission, of entry rather, sorry. Um, often they're the same portal, usually they're the same portal, but not always. So for example, the fecal oral route of getting in oral route, spreading to new hosts, portal of exit would be um, the fecal route. So they're not always the same. Um, so our portals of entry primarily are skin, the GI tract, respiratory tract, urogenital, and then endogenous biota. So our internal bacteria, our bacteria that are normal part of us, um, but if they get into a portal of entry where they don't normally belong, like if uh, E. coli gets into the urinary tract. Then attachment, we talked about those attachment. We have fimbriae that can be used for attachment, capsules, uh, surface proteins, um, and viral spikes. In order to evade host defenses, we have to avoid phagocytosis, so the glycocalyx, avoid death inside the phagocyte. So some pathogens are actually, when they're phagocytized, when they're engulfed, um, like HIV, they use that as a way to get carried on to new cells. Um, that's just part of their life cycle. Uh, and the absence of specific immunity. So if we don't have antibodies, if we've never seen this pathogen before, we can survive a little bit longer as a pathogen because uh, it takes a little while for our immune system to fully gear up. Uh, we would have our innate responses, our nonspecific responses, but without those antibodies, without that specific immunity, our T cells, the cytotoxic T cells, um, it's a much slower response until we get that specific immunity. And then causing damage, this is where we really see disease. We have some impact. So we can have direct damage to tissues and cells through toxins or enzymes. Um, many bacteria 
release exoenzymes as a way to eat. They break down big molecules in the environment around them into small pieces that can fit through that cell wall that they can bring in through their plasma membrane. Uh, those exotoxins aren't there intentionally to, hey, let's go cause harm in the host. They're there to bring food into the bacteria for survival, um, but they do cause damage to the host. We can also have indirect uh, damage, like inducing uh, an excessive host response. That's an allergic reaction. Um, and then we're gonna exit the host. And again, we have portals of entry, respiratory tract, salivary gland, skin cells, fecal matter, uh, the urogenital tract, and blood. And we have specific portals of exit for specific pathogens. So causing damage, we can cause damage uh, through enzymes, the activity of enzymes, and the enzymes are released by bacteria not to harm the host, but to break down big molecules, to get small molecules for nutrients, to get nutrients, um, but that does damage the host. And then the other way is through toxins. And our two big groups of toxins, toxins are classified by what they act on, so neurotoxin acts on the neuro nervous system, um, uh, hemolysins, you see with the uh, uh, streptococcus, they break down red blood cells. Um, oh, sorry, that's an enzyme. Yeah, so for toxins, sorry. Um, uh, neurotoxin, I think what other kind of toxins? Nephrotoxins would act on the kidneys. Um, our two big groups of toxins that we divide into for bacteria are endotoxins and exotoxins. And we've talked about the endotoxin. This is the lipid A, the lipid portion of the lipopoly, lipopolysaccharide outer coating of a gram-negative bacteria uh, upon cell death. It's an endotoxin because it's inside. It's part of that bacteria. It's on the outer surface, but it is a structural component of that bacteria. It doesn't cause damage until it's released from that cell wall, and that happens on cell death. Um, exotoxins are more often associated with gram positives. They take a much uh, smaller dose to be toxic, so in very minute amounts, um, and they're typically small proteins. So other than the endotoxin, your best guess would be gram positive for exotoxins. There are a few gram negative exotoxins, uh, but primarily we associate those endotoxins, the lipid A, with our gram negatives. Uh, this chapter has a lot of definitions, so be sure to look over the specific definitions for uh, terms related to infections, um, to terms that we use to describe illness and contagions that we use commonly, but not always necessarily precisely or accurately. So you want to look that over, like Table 11.4 as an example. Uh, it talks about the stages of disease. So you've all done the Chapter 6 discussion question showing bacterial growth curve. It's very easy to confuse these two. That is a quantitative curve, the bacterial growth curve in Chapter 6 with the lag phase, the log phase, the stationary phase, depth phase. Um, that describes and counts, it's quantitative, the numbers of bacteria. That's when I grow my bacteria in a test tube or on a Petri dish. That's the curve I get. This, the stages of disease, looks similar, but this is a qualitative chart. This describes the intensity of symptoms when you get ill. When you get sick, the initial exposure, here's my intensity of symptoms. Ah, here, no symptoms, nothing during the incubation period. I don't even know that this pathogen has gotten in, but it's gotten in and it's staying in and it's starting to multiply. Uh, I haven't had any adverse effects yet. And like, ooh, then I come to the next step, the prodromal stage. Here, I'm not convinced I'm sick, but uh, I'm getting some symptoms here. I'm not feeling good. I'm a little achy, a little just feel blah. And then we hit the period of invasion. Here's my, where my symptoms get worse. I know I'm sick now. Uh, I get worse and worse and worse until the peak here, the height of infection. At this point, my immune system has started to win the battle, so I'm not getting any worse. 
might take me a little while to get better. Uh, but then I will enter the convalescent period where my symptoms lessen uh, and they may completely go away. It's an acute infection that can be cleared. If it's latent, uh, this curve can continue, continue on over here for persistent infections where uh, I am not feeling any symptoms, but I'm still possibly a carrier and able to spread this. So as a carrier, we talk about uh, transmission. A uh, carrier could be somebody who's a reservoir. So a reservoir is where I would find this. Where do I normally find? Where does this pathogen normally exist? It could be animals other than humans. It could be in humans that are actively ill or just carriers. They, are, they have a persistent infection. They've recovered, but they continue to shed the virus. They can be asymptomatic uh, and shed the virus or conti continue to shed the virus. Um, so lots of these are all considered reservoirs. This is where this pathogen exists. Um, arthropods can be a vector, insects. And then we can have non-living reservoirs like soil or water or air um, or even the built environment. Oop. Here we go. Here we go. Sorry. Uh, and we look at Patterns of transmission in communicable diseases. How contagious is something? That tells how likely it is to spread between people. Um, but then transmission is how it's spread. Is it direct transmission uh, through direct contact, touching, being close, droplets? I don't have to actually touch the person, but something that I am suiting during contact with them. Um, this is not indirect, this is still direct because we have face-to-face, -face. we're in the same presence. Uh, indirect is refers to when whoever is spreading this is not present at the time the other person acquires it. So it might be through touching something that someone who um, was ill touched. It might th be through, that would be like a fomite. We're gonna use the example of a tissue, a doorknob. Could be vehicle transmission spread through the air or through water uh, or food. Um, it could be vector transmission in that it's carried by an arthropod, an insect usually. Uh, this section of the chapter talks about nosocomial infections. Those are hospital acquired. The vast majority of those are urinary tract infections, uh, indwelling catheters to so anything that is entering, um, entering the patient, so indwelling catheters, um, ventilators, any kind of uh, intubation has the potential to infect the host. So respiratory, urinary tract, and then surgical sites, any parenteral, any cutting of our first line of defense, the skin leaves us open to infection or allowing things to get inside. Uh, we did discuss Koch's postulates. Um, those were those four steps that prove causation. So that was the importance. Up till then, there was correlation, but you can correlate a lot of things with a person's illness. You could say, oh, I have Staphylococcus epidermitis on my skin, and I am sick, I have a cold. They must be related. No, not really. This was the first time we had definitive, a step-by-step -step process to get definitive causation, not just correlation. And that was pretty huge because it allowed us to treat for a specific um, problem, treat the cause, not just the symptoms. Uh, so etiology, this is Koch's postulates are etiology, the study of the cause of disease. And the next section of the chapter is on epidemiology, the study of the spread of disease. Uh, and there's terminology related to that with epidemics, pandemics, um, endemics, which are just diseases that are always present, not in huge numbers, but sort of always background presence in the population. Chapter six on growth. I think everybody's good with chapter six. Um, you know, the organic compounds and what they're made of, proteins, nucleic acids, carbs, lipids. Um, that makes up the vast majority of humans. Um, or of all living organisms. 
Um, and so yeah, that's our discussion question. Organic compounds all have carbon attached to hydrogen and then other stuff. So carbohydrates, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Um, proteins, amino acids are made of a carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. They have an amine group, which is nitrogen. And then depending on which amino acid we're talking about of the 20, they may have phosphorus or sulfur. Nucleic acids, the monomer for those are nucleotides, which are a five carbon sugar. So carbon, hydrogen, oxygen with a phosphate group attached, so phosphorus and oxygen, and a nitrogenous base. It means it's a base that contains nitrogen and carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Um, let's see, carbs, I mentioned lipids. We have a fatty acid tail. That fatty acid tail are long chains of carbons and hydrogens. Uh, and then they have a glycerol molecule which will have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, um, may have a phosphorus attached to it. So all of those here have our schnapps in different combinations or variations. Uh, it talks about the different organisms, the classification of organisms based on how they obtain energy. Uh, and this we talked about a little bit when we talked about microbes, pathogens causing damage with enzymes. Uh, microbes eat by transporting molecules across their membrane. They don't have a mouth, so they have to have molecules small enough to move either through a um, membrane protein or right down to the elements that can move across through the phospholipids, um, but they use exoenzymes. They produce enzymes, release them into the environment, break down polymers or big molecules into their smaller pieces, and then use diffusion or facilitated transport usually to bring things um, across the membrane or to move waste out of the membrane. So we have passive and active mechanisms to get or get molecules across the cell, in or out. I think activity three, everybody should have figured, worked through this and figured out the differences um, of diffusion and osmosis and why these are important. All the chemical reactions that take place in a cell, that's metabolism, uh, need to do so in an aqueous solution. So osmosis, keeping the appropriate water balance is important. And also that's how we move uh, different molecules the solute items that the bacteria needs, resources in and out across that membrane through diffusion. Section 6.2 talked about the growth factors. So this relates to things you're doing in lab. Um, chapter two has a really good discussion, nice summary of what's going on or what you would be doing in lab with media, different types of media and how they're used. Uh, so you might want to look through Chapter 2 in the textbook, even though it's not assigned um, in the class. It's a good resource for lab. So Section 6.2 talks about environmental factors. These are things other than the nutrients that are schnapps. Those are the things we need to get in to eat. Just think about eating. So to separate nutrients from environmental factors, it's what would, think what would you eat and where would you be comfortable for environmental factors. So what temperature? the pH, the gas, you need oxygen, carbon dioxide is oxygen toxic to you, um, osmotic pressure, radiation, um, and atmospheric pressure are some of the environmental factors that we have to consider. If I want to grow a bacteria in the lab, not all bacteria like the same conditions. So we need to know what conditions they like. Not all bacteria like body temperature. Mesophiles grow from a minimum temperature of 10 degrees Celsius to a max of 50, with their peak or optimal growth temperature at about 37 body temperature. These are most of, most of the bacteria associated with us, with our normal biota and with pathogens, but we have those that like extreme cold. 
uh, the psychrophiles. We have psychrotrophs, which are the bacteria that cause spoilage in the refrigerator. They like those cold refrigerator temperatures. Uh, thermophiles that like hot environments and extreme thermophiles like we would find um, at Old Faithful in a geyser uh, or in deep sea hydrothermal vents. So we have to know what temperature the bacteria likes in order to grow them because outside of their range, they won't grow. Same thing for pH. Not all bacteria are neutrophiles. They don't all like pHs between 6 and 8. Uh, so we'd have to know what their preference is in order to grow them in the lab. Um, their gas usage or oxygen usage. Uh, and I do want to point out, so the terms obligate aerobe, I have to have oxygen. I can't grow without it. Obligate anaerobe, oxygen is toxic to me and kills me. I cannot have oxygen. Uh, facultative anaerobe, this is the one that's easy to mix up because anaerobe is in the name. Facultative means I can be an anaerobe. These are really aerobes who are able to grow without oxygen. They grow much slower without oxygen. They prefer to grow with oxygen. The book's a little ambiguous about this. It says they do not require oxygen for metabolism, but use it when it's present. They not only use it, they would use it preferentially because they can grow better. It's a better energy source to do aerobic respiration. Um, so facultative anaerobes grow faster, better, prefer oxygen, but are able to um, grow without it. And then osmosis, the diffusion of water through a selectively permeable membrane. Uh, water moves toward the hypertonic solution. The hypertonic solution is the one that has the higher solute concentration. Uh, so just like our slug, if we put salt on them, that salt is hypertonic. Uh, it's 100% salt. That's the ultimate hypertonic solution. So no matter what the concentration in the cell is, water is going to move out of the slug toward that hypertonic salt. Similarly, when we put our carrot into fresh water, uh, water from your sink has no salt in it, so it's 0% solute concentration, the ultimate hypotonic solution. So no matter what's in the cell, it's more than nothing, and water will flood into it because it's hypertonic compared to a 0% solution. Uh, the last part of this section deals with interaction with other organisms because they all live together. It talks about symbiosis, symbiotic relationships, uh, commensal where one species benefits, the other is unharmed. Mutualism, like us with our E. coli, both species benefit. Uh, and parasitism, where one species benefits and the other dies or is harmed. Uh, and talks about biofilms, which is an example of synergistic relationship. You can have multiple species of bacteria living together. It's not a symbiosis. It's not necessary for their survival. But together, uh, they can do things that they can't do on their own. They both benefit and uh, have new mechanisms or new behaviors that they don't have when they live uh, without the others in this biofilm. Uh, an example is quorum sensing. Uh, the last section, 6.3, talks about the bacterial growth curve, double time, um, doubling time or generation time. It goes through binary fission and how that leads to log logarithmic growth. One bacteria becomes two, become four, become eight. And as we proceed, the numbers double. So it gets faster and faster, a greater and greater increase in population. The growth curve, we talked about this in the discussion. So just want to make sure... Um, that you understand not just, we can see here what the numbers are doing. So telling me what the numbers are doing or explaining, oh, they're not growing, the numbers are increasing, they're not growing. Um, I can see that from the graph. What's important to understand is why it looks like this, what's going on in each phase. So here the lag phase, I have no increase in numbers, or I may have a, such a small increase in numbers that I can't really notice it or count them. Uh, here are the organisms are adjusting to their environment. That means they're sensing what nutrients do I have? What's the environment? What environmental factors do I have? What enzymes do I need? What genes do I need to express to get the enzymes I need 
to survive in this environment. So talked about the lac operon and how bacteria turn on and off different genes. They express them or don't based on what they need for efficiency. So here they're turning on and off genes. Uh, and then they're going through synthesis. So that's the adjustment. And the synthesis is now I'm going to build those enzymes so that I can take advantage of the resources in the environment. And now I can grow an exponential growth because nutrients are plentiful. Space is plentiful. I have everything so I can grow at my maximum rate. Every generation, my population doubles. The stationary phase here is my population gets so high, I am now depleting the nutrients and if I deplete nutrients, that means I'm also producing waste products. Um, space is becoming a valuable resource. And so for every additional division, some other bacteria has to die because there aren't resources to sustain an additional per individual. Uh, and then at some point, the waste produced um, is now killing bacteria at a higher rate than division. There aren't enough nutrients to support any additional individuals or even the individu individuals that exist, so we start to die off. All right, our last chapter nine. Let me just say, go watch all the videos I posted. There's a lot in this chapter. I don't expect you to memorize each of the chemical agents of control, but you should understand uh, the terminology, sterilization, disinfection, decontamination, uh, antisepsis, degermination, the differences between those. Uh, understand the difference between microbicidal and microbostatic agents. Here we kill the bacteria, microbicidal. Microbiostatic agents just inhibit the growth of the bacteria. They don't necessarily kill it. Um, and then look at the targets for physical and chemical control. We're going to come back. These are going to be similar targets for antibiotics. So in Chapter 10, we'll look at these again. Uh, so Table 9.1 has uh, our terms, our terminology. Again, we tend to use these terms um, in casual conversation, not necessarily with their specific definitions. So no, they're precise definitions. The control methods, again, I posted videos on these. They're all short videos that give great examples and explanations um, of the physical and chemical methods of control. So you'll want to look at those. Spend some time with this table on least to most resistant. This is how resistant they are to destruction to being controlled, their growth being controlled. Enveloped viruses, this plasma membrane, I can break that apart with soap. And when I do that, I break off those spikes and I bust open that protein coat, easiest to control. Prions, hardest. Bacterial endospores, mycobacterium. Um, so vegetative, those that are metabolically active are going to be easier to control than those that are dormant or insisted. Um, and let's see, yeah, just kind of get some general feel for what's going to make these more or less resistant. Uh, some other vocabulary, antiseptics, you know the difference between antiseptics and disinfectants. Antiseptics are intended for use uh, on human tissue, body, body surfaces. Disinfectants are applied to non-living surfaces. Some chemicals can be considered both. Uh, bacteria static inhibits the growth or the reproduction of bacteria, inhibits, means so it prevents it from happening for now. Bactericidal means a complete loss of reproduction, even if that bacteria is now removed from that chemical agent and placed in optimal conditions. Uh, so when we talk about cell death, what we mean is permanent termination of an organism's vital processes. Not easy to see a bacteria's vital processes. So how do we know that those vital processes have come to a stop? Uh, specifically with bacteria, we're looking for a permanent loss of reproductive capability, even under optimum growth conditions. Uh, and what that means is in the lab, if we see a zone of inhibition, 
around an antibiotic, around a disinfectant, an antiseptic. We're now going to swab for organisms, for cells, individual cells in that zone of inhibition. We knew they did not multiply um, because we don't have a colony there, but we know there are cells there because we inoculated the plate. So let's remove those cells, take them out of where that chemical agent of control is, put them on fresh media, um, giving them everything they need, their optimal growth conditions. And if they do grow and form a colony, we know that that um, agent only inhibited their growth. It was microbostatic. If they do not grow, they don't reproduce, they don't form a colony, then they're dead. And that agent is microbicidal. There are some factors that affect the death rate when we use chemical or physical factors to control growth. Uh, the dosage, the intensity, the number of microbes, how long it's on, how long they are exposed to, uh, to the substance. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, let's take a look at those. Table 9.3 talks about our targets for chemical and physical destruction of cells. We're going to come back and look at these more closely again in uh, Chapter 10 with antibiotics. But the cell wall, the membrane, uh, metabolism, so synthesis of various components, uh, synthesis of things the cell needs, and attacking proteins are our big targets. Section 9.2 goes through physical methods of control, moist heat, wet heat, so uh, and dry heat. Um, talked about that in our discussion, our online discussion. Um, you'll want to go through that table. Pasteurization. We pasteurize to limit growth. We're not going to kill everything. We're going to try to kill whatever we can that can spoil food. But hey, milk still spoils in the refrigerator because we didn't sterilize it. So there are still bacteria present that can cause spoilage. So we want to reduce those to the greatest extent possible without actually altering the consistency or the flavor. That's why we use that for beverages. Um, we can alter the consistency and the flavor. So we're happy with just reducing the number of pathogens rather than eliminating pathogens. And so go over to table 9.7 and Watch the videos. I've posted the videos in the same order that each of these appear in the table. So you can read one section and then watch the video. Same thing for 9.3, chemical methods of control. Um, similar factors are going to affect their ability to control growth or their ability to kill microbes. Uh, videos. I don't expect you to memorize the table. The videos are all short, and I listed them in the same order that you'll find things in Table 9.9. .9. Uh, so take a look at at least some of those. Um, get the highlights for those. And that's it. I don't expect you to memorize them, but some of the more common ones, like how soaps work, what happens if I break the plasma membrane, why is that a good target? because things that don't belong inside can now get in and things that belong inside can get out. Um, how osmotic lysis works, you talked about that in activity three. Uh, and I think that quick summary, well, it wasn't that quick, but that summary should get you through um, a good review to prepare you for exam two. All right, and let's stop recording.